Hey, this is Andy Jenkins with the Warrior Hope Podcast. Every week we try to do two things. Number one, here's our goal. This is the objective. Number one, healing from the past. Objective number two, help identifying the next mission. We believe that the enemy that most warriors face today is isolation. And it could be the sense that the best days that the purpose, that your mission is all in the past. And the reality is you probably had some incredible missions in the past, probably worked with a great group of people in the past. Everything that you're going to do now is either in the present or it is in the future. The reality is the best days can still be ahead. So in our book, Warrior Hope, what we do is we try to discuss those two objectives and we really kind of break them down. Number one, find healing. Number two, find, identify the next mission. And then we invite you to walk with us because we are better together. Now, in this episode, number five, I'm going to introduce you to Major Scott Strickland. He served in numerous capacities in the U.S. Army, including he flew Apache helicopters. Since returning, Scott actually continues to assist fellow veterans who may be struggling with post-military issues. Now, I've seen this guy's heart firsthand. He is a certified John Maxwell trainer, and he brought a wealth of experience and expertise to the table when Bob and I were developing the Warrior Hope curriculum. I'm going to put a link to that curriculum in the show notes as well. Scott was one of the guys that was responsible uh, for helping with verbiage, with military terminology. He helped us really understand how to communicate the concepts that we wanted to teach. As I said, I've seen this guy, met him multiple times, know him firsthand. You're going to hear his compassion and tenderness, even though this guy's a warrior. You're going to hear his tenderness, though, in this talk. He attended the first pilot project of the Centers of Hope uh, that we actually did at Guiding Light Church here in the Birmingham, Alabama area. He always arrived early. He always stayed late. Always, every time you saw him talking with someone that was there, imparting wisdom, infusing grace, most often helping someone navigate the VA, how to get wisdom on how to apply for and get their benefits. This is an incredible guy who truly, deeply cares. I'm excited for you to hear the story of Major Scott Strickland. Hey, I'm actually here in the Crosswinds office with Scott Strickland downtown. Uh, Scott, give us just your, uh, before we get started in your story, I, I really want to hear your story, but tell us, just so everybody knows, just, I mean, I always call it the dog tag information. I don't know if that's even the appropriate way to say it, but just the the vitals, the stats, just so people know, you know, who you are, where you're coming from military-wise. Yeah, so I served in the U.S. Army for 15 years. I started out as a, an E-nothing, an E-1. Went to an basic E-nothing? Training. That's, that's what, the official? That's what we said. And uh, I was dumb enough to, to make it up to squad leader before I left basic, so I left as an E-3. And uh, got picked up in an ROTC scholarship, was in infantry training as enlisted, and then went through ROTC and was commissioned as an infantry officer, went through infantry uh, officer training, was sent off to go hunt bad guys in the infantry, uh, backed into uh, special operations just for a short time, started falling apart, shoulders messing up a little bit, and knees, so uh, I uh, had an opportunity to go into aviation route, so I went aviation route in the last five years. I spent out of my, it's about 17, it's eight, uh, nine active and about eight, a little over eight guard and reserve, I spent flying Apache helicopters. So you're so, flying for... To, to support the guys on the ground. Right, right. Which is so, what you started off as. Right. So which, I went from, yeah, I went from walking to flying over the guys. Uh, so good, really great perspective uh, flying over the guys because I knew what their mission was and I knew the help they needed. So when they called, I could uh, filter through the crap and know where they needed fire, uh, where yeah. they needed support, uh, what they were trying to do, their mission endpoint, and uh, and to help them succeed. Well, it's that, it's that whole thing, like, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. Uh, that, that's kind of the negative aspect. Uh, of it, but, like, you had actually walked the miles. Yeah. I'd or you care. guys call them clicks, right? Yeah. yeah you walked I mean, walk the clicks I, in their shoes, and so you, like, you, 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 you could assess. Like, you could actually help these guys. Yeah, I'd, I had carried the 90 pounds on my back. I had climbed the, the mountains and gotten stuck and fallen off cliffs that weren't on the map. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, I had fallen asleep, you know, walking with a rucksack. I had done all that. So when guys <laughs> called, fell asleep. <laughs> uh, when guys called and I was up in the air, uh, I could again, like I say, I was more effective because yeah. I had walked uh, in combat arms. Uh, so I was truly combat support. I knew what the support the support they needed when they called. That's I, that's a great more metaphor. I want to come back to it maybe at the end of the talk because. One of the things we've seen with the Warrior Hope, Centers of Hope project, is that uh, one, one of the greatest aspects of it is not the material that we, we have or we teach, not the curriculum, not the videos, uh, not, not even the, the podcast. The, the best thing that I think we have, one of the biggest assets, is guys like you who have, have been in the trenches before and are, who are now, you can identify with the men and women who are in the trenches because you've you've been there. You've carried the sack. You've come home. You've tripped. You've fallen asleep. You've dealt with the emotional scars, the invisible wounds, the physical wounds, the navigating, like, what in the world do I know? You know, everything's changed now that I've come back from deployment. Like, you guys have navigated that, and so you have this ability to kind of look down and help encourage, equip, and empower others in ways that books can't do, professionals can't do, well-intended people like me can't do because you've been there. Yes, having the 10,000... I guess uh, ten thousand foot or ten thousand mile view, looking down because I've walked those. Because you were the one foot view. I could, I can more, and I do uh, more effectively help the soldiers that are leaving or coming back, uh, or are are leaving, uh, ETSing uh, out of the military, getting out, yeah, and not knowing what to do, and they're limping, not just physically but mentally and and spiritually, they're limping. So to be able to link arms with those guys and say, hey, there is an option, and let's get you back on mission. Let's get you well first, get you help, and then get you back on mission where you can be as effective as you were when you carry a pack, when you flew, when you, uh, whatever, your, you know, whatever your task was, whatever your mission was, uh, get you back on that uh, to where you could succeed. Take me back, like maybe to the, not the way back in the beginning of your story, but maybe the part where you decided to uh, enlist in the military. What was going on in your mind? What's going on in the U.S. at that time? You know, what, what conflicts are out there? What's going on politically? Just kind of paint that picture in broad brush. When, when, I, when I went in, there was really nothing <laughs> that was in the news going on. It was 1985, and... Uh, I was just interested in going to college, and my parents weren't really able to help me at that time or help me much, but um, I really thought that you needed this college degree or more education, yeah. and I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. Uh, I definitely needed to be sharpened a little more, uh, and education was what I thought would help, Okay. and I knew the military was a great route to do that. My father had served and was... Um, um, well, he was back in the Vietnam era, so he was drafted. Actually, went through a university and was drafted and uh, and went in. So I said, well, that's a route. So that's the route I pursued to help me, really for education. It was a selfish thing. Was this like a GI Bill or? Yes, I mean, this a, is during the era. Of, this it is was, Reagan's president, right? It was, it was a GI back. Bill. I I always wanted to serve. Uh, I was. It's people ask me, you know, what what was the next step? And I said, well, I was a Boy Scout, so I thought the next step was going in the military. Uh, it made so, sense. You yeah. go camp, you carry stuff, you go yeah. up the woods. And, and obviously, uh, for me, it was Army and infantry, uh, not, not any other branches. But for me, that was just the next logical step, and that would also help me finish school. Or, yeah, I'd started a path, but finish school, and also, you know, I'd get a little money, get a little education um, uh, for myself. i mentally be challenged to do more than I thought I could do. And, but bottom line, it was to get a degree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And serve and serve the country. It was probably those were probably equal in my mind. It's a both and. Yeah, yeah. it's it's fitting. To, okay, so you you enlist cuz soldiers now choose to go. We don't have a draft right, right now. Right. Right. And take me from there. You go to I guess boot camp is the first thing that yeah, you guys do, all get to do. I was um I went and took my what they call the ASFAB test, you know, the, to see what uh where you could class, how smart you were, really. It was a brain test to see if you could make it through, you know, be a cook, you know, or be a nuclear submarine uh, specialist. Uh, of course, I was in the Army. 
So uh, I did. I was a little better than a cook. Which no disrespect but, to the cook, because how many people is the cook feeding? Like no, no, I, I thousands, mean, right? I mean, some of the cooks are, like are chefs. Kitchen. It's chef school now. Yeah. Which, uh, when I went in, it was a little different. We always made fun of the guys that were actually feeding us, which is kind of silly. You think of the irony of that. You're like, yeah. this is the guy that's keeping gas in the tank. But yeah. But uh, I uh, I chose infantry. That was one of the one of the ones that that was there, and that was the most interesting. And I guess because I was a Boy Scout, and the, you know, I was promised that I would be in the woods and you know, uh, walking around and uh, doing some uh, orienteering, some map reading stuff and all that. And, and that was true. That's kind of what that I did. That turned out to be accurate? It was, uh, wasn't as fun as promised, but uh, the training was excellent. So that's, uh, I went off to, to boot camp, so basic and AIT, and uh, really pushed myself, or they pushed myself uh, more than I thought I could be pushed. At boot camp? Yes. So uh, your body, for me, i your body can do more than you think. Your mind actually can drive your body through uh, through incidents and opportunities and uh, we'll say missions that you never, on paper, you never thought you would be able to do. Do you remember a specific instance at boot camp where something like that happened? Well, I think the first thing, <laughs> the crazy thing, uh, when we were going off for, uh, we went and bivouacked or went and, and camped, we'll say, for a week, maybe, maybe two weeks yeah. to learn how to fire our weapon. Uh, back then it was just the M16. And uh, me putting on 85, 90, 90 pounds, probably, I'm prob- now probably about 70 in basic, basic training, and carrying our weapon, and then we walked. All of our trails were in sand, and it just didn't make sense because we weren't at the beach. So in my mind, I'm like, so they trucked all this sand in to make us walk in sand. There's no way I can catch up. There's no way I can walk fast enough. And everyone thought the same thing, but yet we all made it. Did they truck the sand in? Is that, I don't is have that a, accurate? I don't have a clue. Yeah, they had to do something. It was it was Because it geographically didn't fit. Yeah, it just, it's, it's bidding. It's Cause, for, cause it's if for that's bidding, a, Georgia. Because so you're, uh, you're carrying 70 pounds-ish. How, 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 you were 18, so... And, uh, yes, I was so 18. So you're, 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 I mean, you're not a really huge guy. No, and I was probably a buck thirty, buck thirty-five, okay. buck forty. So yeah, over half your body half weight, half my and body stuff. weight, and and you're just kind of crouched down, and I never got it. I, you know, I could never get how these drill sergeants were pushing us, and they were laughing and talking. And Are they sometimes... carrying stuff? Or are they oh, just no, their... yeah, they're carrying stuff. Off. Okay. They have a full ruck. Um, All right, so they got it. And you know, walking backwards and encouraging, you know, and uh, you know, with some choice words, kind of pushing us forward. And we're like, well, how can they do that? They're running back and forth. Yeah, back and forth in the sand. So for us digging in, um, that was the first, I think, biggest task, the biggest hurdle for me when I thought I was ready. Yeah. You know, I could do the jog and I could do the push-ups and sit-ups. I could do all that mess. But putting on rocks and walking through through sand, that was the, the first hurdle for me that I conquered. And it was the confidence that uh, again, looking back, that ten thousand foot or ten thousand mile view, looking back, that's why it was there, for something that would push me past what I thought I could do. Yeah. But it was attainable, because everyone, it was almost uh, the peers were there. You didn't know it was attainable, but the people who were training you, that were pushing, they you knew that there. you could. They They're pulling the you to point. something that's in you that you couldn't quite see. They were moving us <clears throat> from. Uh, from point A to point B, making taking us from a civilian to a soldier. And the points, the hurdles, the tasks that they had put in front of us, they knew the end point would be a soldier that would say, if someone said, obviously in the infantry, follow me, and bullets are coming at you, that I would go. Yeah, right. So they took me from that, you know, civilian who would run away to a soldier who would run towards uh, and for me, the first the first big task was just just a eight eight ten mile you know walk in the sand with seventy <laughs> which, pounds. Which they, which they thought you know just a stroll. Because uh, I'm and, thinking you know while you're saying all this, I'm thinking in my head I'm like okay when I go to the beach you know and it's like little kids have so much gear, yeah. and you just carry it through the sand and you're just laboriously like you know not the same right yeah, no, but I'm thinking like you know these kids like I mean what what is all this junk that these kids have you gotta, gotta walk through the sand and you know and so I'm imagining envisioning you know you guys carrying these 70 pound 
rucks. And then I, I remember recently climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, same thing. We're, we're going up to the summit and I've got a backpack on me that's, we were carrying 12 to 14 kilograms max, yeah. about 20 pounds yeah. max yeah. While, while we're climbing. That's yeah. it. And there were these guides that were with us that were so strong that when people on our line got weak, they would take their packs and put it on their back. And sometimes these guys would have two and three packs just stacked, you know, just the shoulder straps, just stack them. And they're going back and forth, up and down the line, like checking on the lead guy. Yeah, I was up there with the front guys. They go back down, check the bottom people, you know, sometimes 50, 60 meters behind us and go all the way back up. I mean, the whole day just back and forth. And then they'd come back up. They'd help me, like, you know, give me a hand up on something. They'd go all the way. And so I'm imagining, you know. Well, oh, that's what the drill totally sergeants were doing, moving back and forth. That's the only grid I have to understand is yeah. so like what your drill sergeants were doing, totally different, you know, because you guys carry more weight. You're actually saving lives. You know, I yeah. wasn't. But but again, it's the, start, the startup, you know, the first the first walk in the sand, the stroll in yeah. the sand, you know, when we're crutched, I mean, our backs are bent over, our knees are killing us, our boots are full of sand. From that point to the end point to where we had to, I think the one of the last gates was a five mile. I think, yeah, or, I don't know, maybe it was twenty mile. It was some long walk. It was a breeze. Yeah, and, seems absurd on the front right. end, but then you get. And we were, and we were, our backs were strong, our shoulders were strong, our knees were strong. We were walking up upright, no yeah. mo more crotch down and and sweating and crying. We were, uh, we were moving with purpose uh, to an end point. Where before we were just kind of, kind of like cattle, you know, and uh, bent over. Nobody was looking up. They kept telling us, you know, keep your head up, but we couldn't. We were always looking down because it was killing us. Uh, but again, the drill sergeants knew they had to do that for the end point for us to be ready uh, to stand up and carry the weight and strengthen our back, really, and not just our back, strengthen our minds where. We were stronger. At which point do you think, in your mind, you became a soldier, where you ceased, not not officially. I know when you sign and take the oath, okay, you're officially a soldier. But but when did you feel feel like one? Uh, I told you I went from an E nothing to an, an E three, but it was probably mid through my my the, the the last part of my infantry training when they gave me. The Beetle Bailey will say we got. They gave me the guy that would show up uh, in the morning with one one of one low quarter on and one boot on. So he was so screwed up in his mind, he would get so flustered. Uh, but I knew I was a soldier when when Beetle Bailey was the best guy in the platoon, and and I had helped that. I was the guy that would on the next rope march would walk behind Beetle and lift his pack up for a while. Yeah. And then Steve would come over and, and help. We would So when we worked as a team, that's when I knew I was a soldier. It was more than just about me. Not just you. It was about we're getting, for us, it was, I don't know how we're going to get Beetle Bailey across the line, you know, for him to finish. And there were three or four Beetle Baileys, and the drill sergeant put them all in my squad. Okay. Because he said, you know, Strickland, if, if you're if they fail, you're failing. So that task was on me, and there were a couple of a uh, couple of soldiers that helped. But I knew that the first time when Beetle Bayless showed up in what he was supposed to wear, and I had gotten up an hour and a half early, and I wasn't on CQ Fire Watch or whatever. I had gotten up an hour early to make sure Beetle Bailey had his boots out, and literally laced up his shoes. For Beetle to make it out to, to our formation, on time, we'll say even early with what he was supposed to wear. That's when I knew I was a soldier. Okay, it so was, yeah, so that I mean that answer was partly about you, but it was it, it was about all about the, me and your empowerment to be on mission to help the team. Yeah, it was it was about me, not it was not about me anymore. Yeah, it was helping others get across, not just get across falling, but get across with their head up. Uh, you know, breaking through. Yeah, it was, uh, that's when I knew I was a soldier. And this was probably five, six weeks, seven weeks, uh, six weeks probably before we finished. Yeah. Uh, it just clicked. Something, in, yeah, somewhere in the middle. Uh, talk to me about deployment, uh, because it, at some point you guys got activated and you're you're overseas. What, what, what can you say about that whole scenario? Well, see, my first... 
my first deployment, I had gone from active and had gone back in a reserve slash guard unit and was full time. We call it AGR, so active guard reserve. And um, I had done some other stuff in the infantry, but this was actually when I had already, my first deployment was when I had wings on, was an Apache guy. And, so um, that was uh, later in your That was 10 later years later. So I had never, uh, we'll say, ets I had been on missions internationally, yeah. but they were all just uh, like short what's, Like short what's something missions. that you can share that you had Well, I mean, like a, a re- reforge in Germany. Okay. You know, uh, I was able to be a part of that. Some of the stuff uh, in, we'll just say. This in is after the Berlin Conus, Wall. Yes, okay. in Conus, you know, uh, Fort Polk going you know, going and working uh, at JRTC, which is infantry training, and uh, going to back to Benning and helping uh, the 75th Ranger Bat, working with those guys on, uh, you know, we're clearing rooms and how, how to most effectively do that, and them teaching me, and then me looking down on them and going, hey, you know, let's cover this better, whatever, just working with uh, with the Ranger Bats and their training, which was huge. Rewriting the FM 7-8, which is the infantry manual that's what we have to know backwards and forwards oh, you basic, rewrite that? basic infantry training so some neat things like that but there was no a deployment to where uh, until i went to uh, korea as a, an aviation guy when uh <clears throat> over over a year probably i guess it was i can't remember 12 maybe 14 months uh something like that that i was deployed to korea that was <laughs> That was my first deployment where I knew I was going to live somewhere permanently. Um, And always people think, are you going to Korea? I was forward deployed in Korea. We always forget when we get there that uh, it's not, there's no peace there. There's still bullets flying periodically. They don't have many bullets. Uh, But that's when I, uh, it it was, that's when I was actually deployed for, uh, into another country. That was my first. So what, what, talk, talk to me about that, because you guys live on base, and then... I actually didn't live on base. They didn't have enough room for me, so I actually lived, which I loved, I lived out in the community. So okay. uh, I lived with, uh, with Ajima and Adishi. I lived in their house, on the below, uh, below their house, and would eat uh, with them, eat their kimchi, as they would go. Uh, it was buried in the ground there. I'd walk by it when I came, you know, came back from work, per se. Uh, well, what is it, kimchi? Uh, uh, kimchi, it's it's rot, rotten cabbage. And, rotten uh, cabbage, rotten okay. cabbage with hot spices and stuff. So just some neat, uh, some neat, <coughs> excuse me, some neat things that I put in. Uh, I intentionally wanted to be part of the culture, where I could most effectively uh, help the help the Koreans. That's what we were there for, and uh, uh, so it was. It was surreal. I mean, when we got activated, when we get called, and something would happen internationally that would never may per se make it the papers here but yet we were there spinning up and going to uh, you know whether it was look for yeah what's something you guys did that you can tell <coughs> I know being oh, in special forces there's some oh. things that you just can't say right now uh, I was but... just in a basic uh, uh, Apache unit we did work with special operations there some of the Navy guys uh, and stuff and they uh, yeah it was always frustrating some they didn't know what was going on down below them. <laughs> uh, they were just flying around like goofballs in, in my mind. I, I yeah. apologize if they had a mission. But uh, but our mission, initial mission when we got there, was to go look for North Korean subs and uh, and North Korean ships that were coming across the border. <clears throat> Man, I'm caught. <clears throat> uh, there we go. Coming across the North Korean border. So that was uh, our main purpose when we got there was an overwater mission, and it was the first ever so you're flying the helicopter over looking over, for subs over water, being vectored by North Korean. I mean, being sorry, being looking for North Korean <clears throat> whatevers and being vectored by Navy guys. So this was the first overwater mission. So you guys could theoretically be shot down ever. Yeah. I mean, this is not just a oh we're flying yeah. over and the looking at nice float. stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're yeah. it's all steel. So it was uh, that was incredible. That was really really neat. I mean, there were other. I had already flown the border. Uh-huh. Uh, we also had a border mission to where we just kept checked the border and would fly that back and forth <clears throat> and would see some interesting things as we flew the border. But then they pulled our uh, squadron, I'll say, and, and, and sent us to watch 
uh, watch or search or, uh, yeah, look for North Korean subs and ships. So you guys are trying to keep the peace between North Korea and South, or keep the appearance of peace between North Korea and South Korea during that time? Is right, absolutely, yeah. T- tell everybody what I mean about that conflict, because a lot of people don't know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just, an armistice. Yeah, it's an armistice. So, I mean, every once in a while, uh, you know, the guys on the border uh, first, I don't know who, who those guys were, up at Eve Camp Eagle, I mean, they would get shot at periodically. I mean, bullets periodically would, you know, they would shoot a few bullets at us. Uh, so, I mean... It's the same as us flying over. You know, we'd get shot at every once in a while. It was not, uh, a, it was not war, but there was no peace, and there was just a line, pretty much. Really, we we'll go back to the sand. It's basic, not even a fence. Basic is, it, training. is it there? Some places just literally a no, line. It's like, just a line. Yeah, even when we were flying the the border, uh, you had to make sure that you were you were on our side because there was no line in the sand. It was it was it would say so. It's uh, it was interesting, but it's again it's an armistice. It's not a peace. They said we're going to stop shooting, our our we're going to stop where we are, and and they're going to stop where they are. So we came up with this thirty uh, fourth parallel or something yeah. in in the line, and uh, and sometimes there were incursions, you know, uh, but why is North Korea and South Korea? Why is that strategic? Uh, I. Th- uh, the peninsula is probably not the most important thing, but because of in my in my mind what I understand is uh, any incursion on our part would bring the Chinese and Russians Damn. quick quickly to North Korea's <clears throat> help. Okay. So uh, and actually during the Korean War, you know, we were fighting more than just the Koreans. We were fighting the Chinese came on board and all that. Yeah. So so that's the important thing I think is keeping that line in the sand there, and we're protecting. The freedom of the southern of the the Koreans, the South Koreans, and the North Koreans, obviously, is uh, is communism communist and, and non communist. I mean, in Korea yeah. is in the news now. Like, who you know, like Trump yeah. keeps I mean, tussling with those guys? Yeah, I mean, they're still starving. I mean, they're still. I mean, I know when we were there. I mean, there's cannibalism going on. There's some there's some really really bad stuff going on in North Korea, and I always thought in my mind, the U.S. is there. To stop South Korea <laughs> from attacking North Korea, which would be World War III. Yeah. In my mind, I'm like, we're here holding these guys back. Do you think that would uh, be World War III? Uh, I don't know, but it would be. It, it well, be well, well you're Korea, there, like... Korea, 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 North Korea doesn't have a lot, but uh, but it, the people that would come to back them. But it was pretty crazy. I mean, to think to talk to some of the guys and actually to see, you know, that uh, I mean, stuff still goes on that you know that doesn't hit the paper. It's it's small. But uh, there's not there's no peace there, and uh, it's to think you know that we're going to Korea to take a break, you know, from being deployed back then to Kosovo or whatever, and then the Desert Storm stuff started kicking up. You know, you're going to Korea to take a break. It really wasn't a break that we thought it was. Yeah. Uh, because. You know, we're still hunting for bad guys. If you're over here, it seems like a break. But if you're over there right. in the middle, yeah. of it, you're like, no, 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 there's a lot that's going on on yeah. on the surface. Um, we're you, still hunting for bad guys, and and the flying in Korea is is super dangerous with uh, the topography and the wires and stuff. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. How many soldiers uh, ride in an Apache helicopter? Oh, okay, it's just it's just two. It's a tandem. Uh, the we say the the pilot, or we call the pilot in command, yeah. is is in the back seat, and the uh, the pilot slash gunner is in the front seat. And the front seat guy usually controls the hellfires. The back seat guy is uh, uh, is I guess security for the helicopter. So we have we have the thirty millimeter cannon, and also both front and back can fire the uh, can fire the rockets. So usually the back seater. If we're moving, I would fire the rockets that need be, and the front seat guy could have. He's just got uh, a better weapon system set up, uh, the TADs and all that, that he can laze and all that to, to use the Hellfire missile. Which one's, uh, which one's flying the copter? Who's Both can fly, but the, the back seat guy's the bus driver. Generally, the back guy's the bus driver. Yeah. And kind of, because kind of, kind of an elevated seat there. Right. Um, and right. then, okay. And, and again, I'm, I'm our local security. I'm security for the. For the helicopter with the 30 millimeters, so I can, you know, wherever I look, the uh, 
the, the weapon is slayed to my helmet. So wherever I look, I can control and protect us and our helicopter. And, um, and then he's fighting. It's slayed to front. your helmet? Yes. So if you move your head, this thing, yeah. like, this is like a video game. I mean, I mean, for lack like yeah, it 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 is really it's really neat. But I mean, real. there's some neat thing about you know you know when you're heli- when you're hovering in an Apache, you're at night and you're looking. It's I was think I, I can't even remember now. I think 17, 12, 17, 14 feet in front of you. Yeah. So when you're hovering to the right, you're actually <clears throat> you're looking fourteen feet in front of you. So you're not looking to the right because your Pinvis, your pilot's uh, navigation system. Uh, is way up there in the front of the helicopter. Okay. So that's that's where you're looking when you're looking to the right. I'm not looking here. I'm looking. Tw- so it's you kind of get adjusted to it. That's uh, pretty weird. Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, and flying with that, you know, one eye with with that system and one eye, you know, looking uh, infinitely and one eye focusing um, close in. Yeah, it screws you. Your brain is kind of fun. It's, it screws with your brain. It's oh, kind of fun. That's what you said. Yeah. It's, well, I mean, it takes a while for you to stop closing your eye and opening the other yeah. way and then eventually your brain just gives up so yeah figures it out you're screwed <laughs> figures out how to do it. so uh you you did spend some time in desert storm uh no no i was uh i was not in desert storm i was activated to go there but i uh, uh i actually was doing some more training flying then wise but i was never deployed uh like in korea for for a long time after that okay so yeah well, tell me, when did you finally make your way back stateside? How did you, you know, for like a better term, I know you never stopped being a soldier. When did you, when did you retire? What's the path back? Yeah, so my, my path was, uh, was driven by my health. Okay. So when I came back, uh, I went to, uh, to Fort Knox and started working with uh, Apache units. And we actually then we were working with active uh, guard and reserve units that were preparing to go to deploy and some of us went with them. I did not, but some of us went with them. So we were staying with Guard and Reserve guys and active guys, spinning them up. And it got to where my uh, yeah my eyelids started going on me. So if I stared at something, it would blur. So that's not good flying. And then my shoulder started going on me. So uh, my exit was not uh, determined by me. It was determined by my body. Yeah, by the health. Yeah, because I, I still had aspirations of, uh, you know, I had worked with the 160th some, and had flown with them when uh, when I was a leg, uh, an infantry guy, and, and I was had a path to get into the 160th to fly with special operations. Yeah. Uh, SAR guys, and and that just wasn't my body wasn't ready for that. My mind was. So. How how weird was that adjusting? Because you know you leave your 18, um, you go enlist, and most 18 year olds have no idea what they're going to do with their life. Even if we think we did, you know we don't. And then you you have this career, you know, as a soldier, uh, lots of different variations of it. But then, you know, you, you were a soldier, what, 15, 17? Yeah, years? I was I was actually in, I think, 18, but uh, active and then reserve mixed. So you're getting where guys have a midlife crisis. Yeah. And all of a sudden, yeah. this thing is, it was like ripped out from under you. But No, for I mean, me it was it, because it med- is. Yeah. medically it was, uh, I had a career path because I was in and I loved it. And I was good. I was good at it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that that was yeah. When I come out, it, it was kind of throwing my hands up and going, okay, kind of like whiplash. What now? Now? now what next? And it wasn't that I could unplug, you know, in this in the military world and plug into the civilian world, whether it be government or whatever, to fly for the DEA and ATF and all that. And there were options there, but I was broken. I came out physically broken, which affected me mentally, <laughs> also because. You know, I have this path, and now it's like you said, the door was closed, and uh, and then I had to find the next door. So it took a little while. Describe that process, just uh, you know, as much or as little as you feel like sharing. Well, I mean, it was it was probably over. The door was closed probably, probably six or eight nine months before I got out. So I knew the door was already closed. So for me, uh, looking for other doors and trying keys to work. Uh, to see that was uh, a difficult thing. Now I had, I had a pretty good support group in in Kentucky, and actually was a member of a of a church, a local church, and uh, and had some friends there. And that really, I guess, solidified my next direction was to stay there in in Kentucky in the Louisville area, where you had a support system of Where, civilians or military. Uh, 
actually it was it was both, but it was more civilians, I guess, at church. But there were also some military guys. Do you that, think that's uh, important for soldiers who are coming out? Is just to connect with soldiers, or do they need both? I, I think it's important to have to have both. Uh, I think it's important to have both. I think to to talk to the soldiers who uh, who are are getting out and have a path. Yeah. So many do not. Back to the methodology we used before, where you were infantry walking the right. ground, and now you're flying the Apache and can see what they need. Right. So to have soldiers that know what you need. So they're getting out with a direction. Yeah. And there are so many guys that are getting out without a direction, and that was kind of me. And mine was driven physically, but some of them are just getting out because it's time for them to get out. Yeah. Uh, whether they just can't handle it, their family's breaking up, whatever the situation. But to have a military guy that's getting out also, or has gotten out right around that time, and has a direction. And what process did he use to find that? Okay. Uh, and sometimes it's easy. I did this job in the military, I'm going to go do it in the civilian world. But for those that, I did this job in the military and I'm doing something totally different in the civilian world. I fly a fighter helicopter. That doesn't translate yeah, extremely easily. Right. Yeah. And, and actually, I couldn't even fly. So for me, I couldn't even fly anything. Uh, physically, so I mean, my <clears throat> career and even the infantry, I couldn't do, I couldn't go do security and all that. Although I had that in my brain, uh, I could do it. I couldn't physically do it. So I had to start over from scratch. Yeah. Uh, so there were a couple of guys that had gotten out and were doing financial planning or whatever, and they had a direction. Uh, so walking some with them and also walking with some civilians that I knew real well that said, no, you can connect with people. We have opportunities. Stay here in Louisville and we'll make sure that you find a job and then them start listing jobs and then me start again trying those doors, the keys to those doors and going, yeah, this is something I could do. Nah, maybe, maybe. And pursuing two or three and then focusing on, on one and then uh, attacking it. I bet that takes a little bit of patience right there, just trying to... It was hard as crap. Figure out, yeah. Because you're beating your head, and, and I had an end point. I'd already had my medical board and all that, and they said, here is the line in the sand again, going back to walking in that sand yeah. as a uh, as a E nothing, E1. Uh, here was the line in the sand. Uh, you know, So what are you going to do? You're leaving whether you're ready or not. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, and, and when I got out, I had a pretty good direction, but I still, I still wasn't all the way ready. I wish I'd had, you know, maybe six or eight months more just to have that comfort. I guess that security of uh, knowing what I was going to wear every morning. You know, putting my uniform on, uh, make you know, lacing my boots up, uh, and knowing what time to be where and uh, PT is at this time. I mean, all of those uh, very intentional acts that we did in the military. I didn't have any more. So to start those in my mind again, uh, to be intentional about everything I did, was uh, that was tough. Yeah, to look in my closet and go, okay, what do I put on today? Not have that uniform and uh, to walk through all those issues that you go through, especially as a, as a man, but even more so as a soldier. Yeah. What's my mission? I, I think you've got your new uniform because every yeah. time I see you, it's like slacks, Oxford shirt, sport coat. Yeah, and it's interesting. Way back when I was so going through ROTC, there, but... uh, my a sergeant major, uh, SF tabbed out sergeant major, took me aside and spent probably a year and a half with me when I was in ROTC. Yeah, and that was one of the things he he taught me. He said, uh, you know, when when you're not in uniform, I always have always have a jacket on. I always okay. have something to write with and something to write on. So I always have a jacket. Yeah. More than not, with a pen in it and some note cards. So he gave you some structure for, yeah, that yeah. kind of fit with... So he was getting out, and he was showing me that he had a path. Yeah. Uh, and he was helping me, and this was way... This was probably <clears throat> 10, 12 years, I think. Uh, yeah, before I, before I got out. This was a long time. I, I interrupted you. You were talking about mission, like getting out and having something to do. not Like, not just the routine of the day, but the bigger purpose. Um, and, and I know you've got some training as a Maxwell certified coach and some other things. Talk, talk to me about mission. So for me, uh, first I had to, I guess, and walking with some people to remind me what the giftings and uh, task and uh, skill set that I had that I had been taught in the military. And one of them 
was leading. I was in combat arms and I was an infantry soldier and an infantry officer. I know how to lead men. So lead men. I know how to do that. I know how to take a man from point A to point B and give him a direction, a route, and help him support all, you know, gather all the support he needs to complete the task, to, to, to take the hill, to uh, over, overrun the, the enemy. I know how to do that. That was a skill set that was sewn into me in the military. I know how to communicate with people. So they started pulling out this, this is your skill set, you can do this. Oh, you're great at this, you can do this. So that started giving me confidence in who I already was. I just had to be reminded of it. So it got me back on mission, and then it was like, okay, this skill set, all the skill set that I have, not physically, but mentally, yeah. and how I can engage people, how does that equate to a mission in the civilian world? And that's when I started moving forward. And for me, it was uh, walking into pharmaceutical sales position and uh, promoting, I really wasn't selling drugs, <laughs> per se, legally, uh, but promoting you know, drugs. So I was engaging it was a mission every morning. It was incredible. Or however many offices I went to, I could intentionally take that heel in my mind. Yeah. Uh, and and engaging everyone that I knew, and in in the back of my mind, everybody that I engaged, no matter where they were, where they were in the food chain at uh, in this office. It was my mission to make them better that day than they were before I came in. So. Uh, that's my intentionality even now you know I'm 100% disabled I'm falling apart you know uh, joints and, and all that and eyes and just fun stuff glad again I told Andy I'm glad it's not on video but uh, no well, nobody look at you yeah, until yeah. I mean that's that's I, I saw this thing the other day where it was a Facebook meme which is always dangerous right when you're building your worldview off of a Facebook meme and there was a car that was parked at a handicap spot and the person got out and they looked like you wouldn't have been able to tell. Yeah. And so somebody's ripping off on it. Of course, somebody else is like, wait, you have no idea like what? Or So like you look at you, you don't look disabled. Yeah. But, you know, I know you've got the cane. Of course, I've spent enough time with you to know, yeah. you know, you don't move as fast as you did when you were carrying the 70-pound ruck. Yeah. Um, but Yeah, but going even going back to that, the speed that I, I move has, uh, doesn't matter. Right. It's, it's, That's probably it's, important for people to hear. It's not it's the, the speed. Inten- it's the intentionality. Everyone that comes, I, everyone that <laughs> that is on my path today, uh, even the, the gentleman that I talked to in the front, uh, I want them to be better because they saw me. And that moving someone from point A to point B is in, is the driving force in everything I do. So that's going all the way back to being broken down and, and walking that five to seven miles in the sand and not knowing I could do it. Yeah. But, but a drill sergeant walking back and forth, back and forth. You can do it. You can do it. Come so on, you want to be that guy now that's yeah. pushing people a little bit farther in the sand it. that Making might them, not know it. Uh, impacting them to do more <laughs> because they saw me today that they can do more than they think they could today yeah that I give them a route a path an opportunity an encouragement uh, that that hopefully can be sewn in to them whether it even be a 30 second engagement you know at Walmart checkout or something uh, that I'm constantly sewing into them to be better than who they think they can be because you can be you can walk five to seven miles in the sand with uphill seven, both ways, 70, seven, pounds. Yeah, 70 pounds on your back. Uh, and I had to have someone telling me that I could do that because I couldn't. Yeah. Physically, I couldn't do that. But he knew mentally I could and that my body would follow. So no matter if I'm falling apart now with my stick that I walk with and all that, that, uh, that doesn't drive me anymore. My mission is still going back to the the one my sergeant major and then the two active guys that said okay this is what this is who you are it's incredible so whatever you choose to do you're going to be incredible at it because this is your skill set yeah 
and your skill set is very uh, specific to you and it was sewn into you as an infantry officer so you can you can say follow me and people will follow you into the bullets they but, won't run away man I'll, I'll test that because I, I've spent time with you I've never felt rushed when I'm with you like you just stop whatever no, it's, and it's like just that person's a center of focus and like today you know we were meeting here at 9 a.m. And uh, I, I think I arrived at what eight fifty eight. You were here at like eight fifty, texting me, "Hey, I'm already here." I walk in. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to the reception guy, yeah. which no nobody does. Like, okay, you know, everybody exactly. just is like breeze right past. You know, there's this intentionality of just the person right in front of you is the. Yeah. How can I not? How can I not engage the person next to me? I mean, that, and that's just what I was. I didn't know that's who I was until I made it five to seven miles in the sand. I didn't know I could do it. But then I was reminded when I was getting out that this is who you are and you can do it. Yeah. So there was someone saying, no, stay on the mission that you were always on. Yeah, this do your, your you do you. Yeah. yeah. Well, as we um, sign off, like what's maybe the last thing you want to leave everybody with? What's the last thing you'd say? Related to anything we've already said or yeah, I mean, unrelated? I, I think for me, what uh, the key that opened the door that I needed to walk through was was that that I have been put together specifically for me to impact others, and we all have. And it's not it's not this uh, weird combination that we have to find. It's who we are. So if we walk in the skill set that who we are, then we will impact others for better. And that will, in turn, impact us Yeah. to be better. So when we serve others, when we go in trying to help others, we help others, but it really helps us too. That's a good word, man. Well, um, you know, I, I want to say thank you, you know, to you uh, for, for your service in the past, for being you now, walking out. Uh, the process of transformation before uh, other men and women. You know, you were really instrumental in putting together the Warrior Hope curriculum that uh, we wrote, you know, constantly giving us. Some of them were typos. Some of them were, hey, this is an awkward sentence structure. Hey, this doesn't really make the point. Hey, this is not how a military guy would say it. I don't know, right? But you brought that skill set in an unhurried, unrushed, hey, let's bless and bring healing to as many people as we can. And then um, redeploy them with the skills, gifts, calling, capacity they have to be the best version of them. And so uh, thank you so much for walking in that and letting us share that and benefit from that. Yeah, how could I not? We recently hosted a leader certification for uh, people re really from all over, really kind of the eastern side of the U.S., as, as high up as New York, down to Florida, over as far west as Chicago, Mississippi, a lot of people from the Georgia and Birmingham areas. We hosted a leader certification for people who want to get trained to lead centers of hope back in their home areas, whether it's in their business or in their neighborhood or with a small group of veterans or at a uh, some kind of veteran service organization or just a small group in their church. And I had this video, I, I decided to put a video together of people who had been through the Centers of Hope project before, and Scott was in that, in that video. In fact, I'll put a link down to it in the show notes where you can just kind of pull that up and watch it. And in that video, he says, I came to Centers of Hope and I felt like I was there to, to show everybody else what to do. Like I, I had won, I, I now had a new mission and I'm just gonna impart wisdom to everyone else. And, and he totally did that. But, but I love in this video how he also says, when I showed up to give, I was the one who gained so much because there were still layers of things for me to walk through. Now, if that's you, you think that you've already knocked it out. The, the reality is we could always be a little bit physically stronger. We could always be a little bit emotionally more whole as well. There is on our website a free PTSD self-check. The truth is most people aren't diagnosable with post-traumatic stress disorder, yet we could all benefit from another degree of, of emotional health. And the, the biggest way you can do that is simply to become self-aware. So go log on, the link's in the show notes at the warriorhope.com website. When you get there, it is a 10 question 
two to three minutes, yes, no responses. And it's gonna really help you navigate through some of the tough questions and then assess where you are. And if you need to take some next steps, it'll give that to you right there, regardless of how healthy, how whole, or, or how much help you even think that you might need. All of that information is right there. Another favor from you, if you will subscribe to the podcast, wherever you're listening, if you'll do us a review on iTunes or a review on Apple Podcasts or a review on Google Play, wherever you're listening, we would so much appreciate that because it lets those content sharers know where to shuffle our content so that other people can see it and then benefit from it as well. That's it. Again, our goal is to help everyone find healing from the past, to identify the next mission in the present or off in the future. We believe that isolation and that sense that all the good stuff in the is in the rearview mirror, that that is the primary enemy. And we want to walk with you because we are all better together.